Islam has some 1.6 billion followers around the world, making it the world's second largest religion after Christianity. That said, a new crop of female Islamic scholars says there's nothing in the Quran that treats women unequally. Instead, they argue, through the years, Muslim women have been marginalized by cultural practices and patriarchal interpretations of the Quran. These reformers say Quranic verses have been wrongly interpreted to favor men. And now is the time to observe its true meaning and treat Muslim women the same as Muslim men. The most important issue is, are women equal to, to men or not, right? That's the most basic question. And in many surroundings, I heard that men are superior to women. And that, of course, bothered me because I knew they're not. <laughs> I mean, I know me, I know them, <laughs> and intellectually, I was at least as good as some of them and better than others. So, and God knows this. Dr. Aziza Al-Hibri is a law professor and Islamic scholar. She started her journey understanding the Quran as a child. Years later, she began looking deeper into the meaning of the text with what she says are eyes sensitive to patriarchal distortion of each meaning. I started looking at the Quran and found out that it really doesn't say what some men had told us it says. And I thought, you know, I am fortunate. I've had a religious upbringing. I have confidence in my ability to go read the Quran and understand it. Others don't. And therefore, I felt that I have a mission. I have an obligation. Part of my public service to the community, to the women of my community, is to let them know what I see in the Quran, which is different. Once Dr. Al-Hibri began using her scholarly and she says correct reading of verses in the Quran, she concluded that the justice of the Quran does extend to women. Wanting to share this critical knowledge with other women, she started a nonprofit organization called Karama, a name that comes from the Quranic verse which reads, quote, We have given dignity to the children of Adam. End quote. The verse which they claim says men are superior to women. Well, there is no word superior in the verse. The word is, and I'll say it in Arabic, qawamun. What does qawamun means, mean? Well, let's find out. That's where the analysis comes in, and it doesn't mean that at all, it turns out. And in fact, there is enough uh, in the Qur'an to speak about the equality of men and women. For example, we're all created from the same soul. Karama's goal is to advance the gender-equitable principles of Islam to Muslim women in the U.S. and around the world, and to support the rights of Muslim women through education programs, scholarships, and a network of Muslim jurists and leaders. Dr. Raja Naji al Makawi is a law professor in Morocco. She has been called one of the most influential women in the Arab and Muslim worlds and was the first woman to deliver a religious lecture before the King of Morocco. She has also been working as a jurist with Karama for 10 years. Our special objective is to put a difference between the pure rights. Uh, human right in uh, general and the women right uh, especially since 2003 karama has been offering muslim women the tools and skills they need to become leaders and advocates in their communities the training programs range from 3 day workshops to a 3 week law and leadership summer program over the years karama has hosted women of different cultures and societies from dozens of countries in the summer of 2014, after only a few days of attending Karama's law and leadership program, these women say their eyes have been opened about their faith. 
even within the Muslim community, there is so much um, misinformation and misunderstanding about what Islam is and what it isn't. 1,500 years ago, we actually had more rights than we do right now. And the reason that we feel oppressed or we have some things that, um, you know, that don't give us equality is not because of our religion. It's just some of it is culture and some of it is because of the patriarchal society that we live in. Living in Egypt, I realized Islam is not one Islam all over. And that's why you see in the light of current events, different things happening in all these countries and all the turmoil. It's because it's practiced so differently in different countries. And you really have to go and dig down to the root to really truly understand it and distinguish what's cultural, but what's religious, what's informed and what's uninformed. A lot of the laws that we live by are not based on the Quran and they're not based on the teachings of Islam and now we know that and now we can actually when somebody tells us something is not allowed we can actually say yes it is. It gets very very um, personal when you hear um, basically nonsense statements being spoken on behalf of your own religion when you hear the stories from these women coming from different cultures different countries you just learn that this kind of war if you if you allow me to call it it just started you will have to get there, uh, step up, and speak for yourself. One woman who started to speak up for herself is Zara Iqbal from Westchester County, New York. She was introduced to her husband by family. The marriage became emotionally abusive with what she says was her husband hiding behind Islamic law. I had um, been in a forced arranged marriage, and um, after that, I, I couldn't you know, speak up as much as I could anymore. So I wanted to come to Karama to see if, if it would empower me. I was taught that Islamically I do have rights. However, there's a difference between my faith, my religion, and some cultural values. There were cultural aspects in which those rights became restricted and they became confused more than it being that in Islam you don't have rights. Karama became a support group for me with a system that was being used and misused to make me believe that cer certain abusive tactics are okay. Many of Karama's alumni take back what they learn about women's rights in religious law to their countries and communities and try to enact change. Aishat Ifada is a state attorney in the Attorney General's office in the Maldives. She attended Karama's program as well as served a six-month legal internship at the organization. Definitely Karama changed me and yes, me going back and teaching everything that I have learned to my family and to my community, yes, it's like Karama has changed everything. The Maldives is 99% Muslim. The island nation is plagued by domestic violence. According to a landmark study, one in three women in the Maldives experiences physical or sexual violence. To help end the gender violence, the United Nations Population Fund created a 16-day public service campaign called No Excuse for Domestic Violence. A lot of people believe in Maldives, even rest of the Islamic country, I would say that they believe that beating and things are in the Islam. But when I came to El Alaspi and I came to learn that it is not like that. Islam does not advocate for that. Those are the new things that I have learned when I came here. In 2012, the Maldives passed the Domestic Violence Prevention Act, making any kind of domestic violence a criminal offense. Once the law was passed, Ifada, along with Karama's legal team, gave the nation advice on how to make it effective. By going back and doing workshops and doing educational things, so people are now talking about it. People are coming forward about it. I never thought that anything like that would happen to me. For me, it's like I've always been a Muslim. I was born Muslim. But coming to Karama and learning these old things, it's like being born again as a Muslim to me. 
As in the Maldives, women in many Islamic countries are suffering from social oppression presented as Islamic religious law. According to a 2013 Thomson Reuters Foundation survey of gender experts, Egypt has one of the highest levels of sexual harassment and has seen an increase in violence against women since the Arab Spring. In war-torn Iraq, the literacy rate, once among the highest in the Arab world, is now among the lowest, as families fear kidnapping and rape if they send their girls to school. Although Saudi Arabia has had some small advances for women's rights under its strict Wahhabi interpretation of Islamic law, women still can't drive and need male guardians for permission to travel, work, or go to school. And according to the Arat Foundation in Pakistan, honor killings in Pakistan are rampant. Women are killed publicly and brutally because they are perceived as dishonoring their families by violating cultural or religious norms. Honor killings claim the lives of more than 1,000 Pakistani women every year. Yet Islamic law is distorted by many to claim this is not murder. Religion throughout the years has been hijacked um, because it has uh, pandered to a few individuals who have used it for their positions of power. Certainly, there are many people who, as you say, hide behind the Quran, who use it to mean whatever they like. And there are some fairly absurd uh, uh, ideas that have come out of some of these uh, interpretations of the Quran, ideas that, you know, the Quran says that women shouldn't go to work, that women shouldn't go to school, that, you know, we shouldn't uh, wear high heels or wear makeup, and, and there's none of that in the Quran. In the 21st century, I think we have to look at the original texts that we have, the original scriptures, in order for the religious equality to come through. In 2014, Morocco hosted a women's interfaith symposium. Dr. Al-Hibri of Karama, other religious scholars, and women of different faiths came together to discuss women's role in religion and to explore interpretations of text in the Quran and the Bible. It's the first time in Arab country we have uh, this kind of events. And in the, in the context of, uh, of uh, conflict, of uh, war, of, uh, you know, um, struggle and, uh, and uh, terrorism um, in, in all the Arabic world, it's uh, very important to show also that we as a woman, we have the capacity to debate, even with this conflict, even with the religious problems, even with all what, what is going on on the world, we have this capacity to exchange and to uh, debate, a very peaceful debate. I am here at this conference because it's a very unique uh, opportunity for all the, the scholars amongst different faiths to gather together and to think and to reflect about the, about the contribution, contribution of women in, in the history but also in contemporary times on question related to family, related to politics, related to the interpretation of texts. As for equality in the Holy Quran, it is a clear issue in the first verse of the Holy Quran, and he created you from the same spirit. God is not a bigot, is not a racist, and is not a misogynist or anti-women. This is the main argument. We have to go back to the text and study the text. Unfortunately, women didn't have an opportunity to do that uh, in centuries before because they didn't have access to education. And the only ones who had access were really the religious leaders. And so therefore, their interpretation doesn't mean to say it's the correct interpretation. The Kingdom of Morocco is almost entirely Muslim. The country is ruled by a constitutional monarchy, which means the king acts as both the secular political leader and the commander of the faithful. Although Morocco is a modern kingdom, its people come from many ancient cultures and maintain some ancient traditions. 
The city of Fez is home to the largest marketplace. Its leather tannery dates back at least 900 years. And narrow alleys house hundreds of merchants and craftsmen selling everything from food to handmade copper pots. Fez was also once regarded as a seat of Arab learning and a holy city. The University of al Karawiyin, the oldest university located there, was founded by Fatma al firiya in the 9th century and attests to Muslim women's ancient leadership in society and education. Rabat is the fourth largest city in Morocco and is perceived as very progressive in terms of women's rights. For example, the Mudawana, or family code, was revised so that the court had a greater role in divorce, ensuring additional protections for the rights of the wife and children. It also raised the minimum marriage age for women from 15 to 18. And in 2011, the Constitution was changed to guarantee, quote, men and women enjoy on an equal footing civil, political, economic, social, cultural, and environmental rights and freedoms, end quote. Despite these changes in the law, according to UNICEF, 16% of Moroccan girls are married before the age of 18, mainly in rural areas and figures released by the Ministry of Justice in 2012 show that more than 41,000 underage marriages took place in 2010, an increase of 23 percent since 2007. The U.S. State Department also reported that as of late 2012, there had been, quote, little or no progress in passing the organic fundamental laws necessary to implement the advances, such as gender equality and parity, provided for in the 2011 Constitution, end quote. In the rural areas, there are many people who don't know their rights under the law or who are powerless, even if they are aware that they have rights, they're powerless to do anything to enforce them because there are still these entrenched social hierarchies. Unless you get at the problem of existing class hierarchies, ethnic differences, these divides that essentially enfranchise a small percentage of people in the country and disenfranchise the vast majority, you are not going to have gender justice. Changing the role of women under religious laws and in cultural traditions is difficult and slow, according to those in the forefront. When you're referring to the Quran and say, well, women in the Quran are not equal, of course, this is such a generalization and an essentialism. And this is part of the project of Islamic feminism, for instance, is to go beyond that essentialization, that stereotyping, and try to dig, to dig deep into the interpretive tradition. If the majority of men were, like, were uh, agree, agreed with what we say, we wouldn't have you know, problems. So for sure, like, there's a lot of resistance. The tradition is so strong and it's so embedded in their thinking that sometimes I don't even realize that that's discrimination, that what they say or what they do is discrimination. So the thing is that, you know, we have to sensitize and we, we cannot go always with the confrontation because then we cannot work together and we have to work together. We have to, uh, to bring the men into the battle, you know, for women's rights. If we do not have settled interpretations, recognized interpretations, then who would like, would come and say what they like and would pretend that this is religion? And thus, we have been through our, throughout our history that bandits have been walking under religious cloaks, pretending that they are spreading the words of the Lord. Even what might be considered a simple religious gesture, such as wearing the hijab or headscarf, leads to much interpretation when it comes to women's rights under the Quran. There are a couple of references in the Quran about a woman covering herself. But the hijab is often seen in the West as a symbol of Muslim women's subordinate position in society. It has also led to discrimination in many countries, including the U.S. and Canada. We would love to work on more deep issues, but since, you know, the social um, context always brings us to this 
issue of the headscarf, it forces us, like it forces an agenda on us. That's, that's, and that, that's a pity actually, because we're all interested into working in, in issues that are actually the, the basis, you know, of discrimination against women in Islam. The thing is that if the texts are there and if there's an interpretation of the text that says that women has to wear the hijab, the headscarf, then it's up to the women to choose to follow or not this interpretation. And that's the, the dimension of choice that we're talking about. Despite the presence of these religious scholars and Muslim women, they know they're fighting a Sisyphean battle. The idea of gender equality is very problematic, especially when you're talking about the Quran. It's not exactly a, a black and white question. If by gender equality you mean that men and women have equal capacities, equal innate capabilities, equal inclinations and predilections, then I would say it's very hard to make a case that uh, the Quran is gender egalitarian. But if you understand gender equality to mean rights under the law, then again I would say it's difficult to make, if not impossible, to make that case. Uh, for gender equality in the Quran. If, on the other hand, you understand gender equality to mean that men and women have an equal capacity for piety, for understanding God's will, and for upholding the, higher, uh, the highest standards of moral behavior, then I would say absolutely the Quran is gender egalitarian. The problematic is very complex. You have education, you have knowledge, but you have politics. Religion in everywhere and during all our history as a human, it was be instrumentalized by politics. So we need a separation between politics and religion. As for the change, to change the idea that women are inferior to men and that they're equal, this needs time. Because the analysts and the scholars across 14 centuries considered that equality between a woman and a man doesn't exist, basing their argument on status and class. Some Muslim women also believe their battle for women's equality is being fought against other women. The biggest difficulty seen in Morocco is coming from women themselves because they don't discover, they don't, uh, they don't uh, look after their, their rights and they don't practice them. Some women, and I would argue even many women, actually benefit from patriarchy. In some cases, socially speaking, right, their status is elevated when they can show, for instance, that they don't have to go out and work, right? That's not an option for poor women. You have to go out and work and earn money. To do this is a very complex procedure. You don't just go out and say to the Muslim women, you have the following rights and list them. They won't believe you because they've heard otherwise. And others, the men, would think maybe, oh, here's a feminist uh, radical you know, speaking out of turn. What you have to do is to go back to the Quran, to the words and example of the Prophet, to the ancient works on Islam explaining those this tradition and show that even in those days, about 1500 years ago, women had those rights and that they lost them over time as society became more patriarchal. We're not interested in making all Muslim women go around with t-shirts saying, oh, we are feminists. I mean, feminism is not, is not the point, but the point is to develop an awareness and a belief in gender justice and gender fairness. I want to build a strong Muslim women sisterhood yes. around the world. Dr. Al-Hibri and those who study with her believe no matter how long it takes, change will happen. And everything that you know you do, there's going to be challenges, but it doesn't mean that you can't overcome them. And change, it's a process. You know, change in the beginning, you're going to have to go through that. And we should do it because this is our generation. Who are we going to wait for? Who's going to do it? Our parents or our children? So it's our duty. But the key is to, to for, for women who do have access to education, to educate themselves and then they have this huge responsibility to pass on that education to those those women around the world and in, in the United States who may not have access to that education. You cannot push someone who doesn't really know what you're talking about. So you have to know it yourself, then you explain to them because for me it has also taken time for me to learn. So I also have to be patient with the people that I want to learn.
Somebody said this is a, a, a silent revolution. Yes, it is a silent revolution. Revolution, but we will uh, we will uh, win in the in the end. I'm sure. The program is very strong, but in the end, I think you will also benefit just as much from being with each other. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. And I think you're starting to feel it. Yeah. Yes. yes. You see the diversity of being a Muslim. I mean, just look at this table, for heaven's sake. <laughs> just look at those four women. They're pretty different. <laughs> and, and they all right, trust each other, love each other, yeah, non-judgmental. Non yeah. Am I right? Yeah. yeah. Yes. <laughs> there is respect that goes through regardless of differences. That's what we teach.